know what really makes us mad? Is wasting money on CDs with only one or two good songs. Yeah. Tell them about punk! Hello everyone and welcome to Punk Lotto Pod, the game where no one wins. I'm your co-host Justin Hensley. I am your other co-host Dylan Hensley. And this is the show where using a number generator and the Rate Your Music Punk Charts, we pick one album and one EP at random to discuss. Right up off the top, just want to continue to say, please go rate and review us on iTunes. Uh, we need a couple more ratings or reviews just to, so that people can discover us a little better and to show those guys who called us morons uh <laughs> still salty <laughs> we're we're very petty I'm um <laughs> just move past yeah. it <laughs> just just move past it did you do anything exciting this week uh yeah i went and, uh jammed with a drummer for a second time and things seem to be kind of picking up there and uh just kind of starting to feel out feel out for some uh bass players i've gotten a couple of text email responses from from some potential bass players and I did have a uh it was funny a, a guy that I had talked to back in December when I thought I had a drummer uh <laughs> um who I was gonna see about maybe bringing in for guitar or bass texted me out of the blue and was like hey I saw your ad again I, I guess we talked previously uh be interested so I might see if see if he's interested I think he's more interested in guitar which is maybe a, not the most necessary at this point but you know, depending on what he can do, wants to do, yeah. might work out. Might be worth seeing. Take a little bit of yeah. load off of me so I can play and sing better. <laughs> you could you can play like Tim Armstrong. Just strum every once yeah. in a while and do all the singing. <laughs> but you know, just uh happy to see some forward movement. Yeah. That's that's my biggest update. I don't when is this episode going up? <laughs> Let's see. This will be up the 27th yeah or the or the 26th rather so i just got back from la but we'll tell you more about that next week <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> wait will we no not even then <laughs> two weeks <laughs> we record these in advance yeah, we'll get it's to the it. only way to keep ahead so for me this week i took our 15 year old brother record shopping he has better taste than we uh, did at 15 oh most definitely <laughs> He's not buying Christian ska <laughs> and uh, metalcore, so... <laughs> the complete Supertones discography. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so much MXPX <laughs> and... Pillar and P.O.D. I think I was still in the new metal at 15. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. were. It took a few years. <laughs> hey, you had that Chevelle, so... It's <laughs> not just me. Hey, that was mainstream, though. So was P.O.D. Yeah. Um, he had text, uh, my mom had actually texted us a few days ago and he said, she said he wanted to know the next time I go record shopping because he's got like Christmas money that's still burning a hole in his pocket. <laughs> and I was like, and so, um, we've ruined I, his even life. Though I, <laughs> yeah. So even, even though I had just been to lunchbox, like the week before I was like, uh, I want to encourage this bad habit. So picked him up. And we went to Lunchbox again. And if he starts now, he, think about how many records he'll have by the time he's my age. Right. Yeah. That's nuts. I mean, he'll probably have some lean years in college if he doesn't have a job. But I'm sure he'll have stuff he'll part with too. Knowing him, he'll probably have a job or something. And so, I feel like he's gonna. He's the <laughs> out of the three of us. He's the one who got it right. <laughs> I mean, it's a little early to tell, but so far, <laughs> he, um... Just some he mild self-deprecation. <laughs> so, he bought, he 
He's stuck. He's stuck in the eighties still. That's um, fine. Yeah, it's fine. He bought a Blondie album, and I can't remember the name of the album. I think is there, is there a Blondie album called like The Hunger mm. Hunter? Hunter. Yeah. It. It. Uh. I think it's oh, one of the. Yeah. It may not be a good Blondie. Yeah, album, that's the one where she's but... got the big hair. Yeah. Yeah. But it was an eighty-one. Weird. I um, have heard stuff from it. I don't think it's very good. I don't yeah, see anything on there that I know. Yeah. Who knows? But he got that. He got... I guess I should have actually looked. I looked at the artist. I remember, wrote down the artist, but I didn't write down the uh, albums. He bought a Cheap Trick album. He'll be the one. <laughs> that maybe gets yeah, it. Yeah, he'll be the... You see, he already... Because he likes the cars, too. And I'm just like, ah, I can never get into them. I can't get into the cheap trick. Like I can appreciate things about cheap trick. I can appreciate things about the cars, but yeah, he he's picking up some of the ones that that we skipped. Yeah, he got he picked up. I think all shook up is the album he picked up. I don't know the, any of those songs on that album. It's the one after Dream Police. So he also picked up a Stray Cats album. So we have to make sure he doesn't fall into the rockabilly psychabilly. <laughs> get it? I have a Stray Cats album. I mean. They're a good band. It's the, it's the big one. It's the one with um, Rock This Town. I almost gave so. him my copy of it. Actually, I thought about doing that, <laughs> but he has two now. I think. Oh, yeah. So, oh, we gotta be. <laughs> if if he starts greasing his hair up, <laughs> we're getting real into muscle cars. Then uh, we may have to. <laughs> have an intervention i'm getting really into muscle cars though (laughs) (laughs) and then i made him buy a record (laughs) you're boring this (laughs) they had mac mccann's solo album for five dollars so i was like you should buy this yeah because that album rules i said this is the lead singer super chunk it's five dollars and he's like okay and (laughs) he didn't even question it so that's good he told me that his favorite record that he got from christmas was the english beat special beat service nice like, I'm glad I bought that one. one. Yeah. So now we know to get him the other two. But yeah. Uh, and then, even though I had just been there a week before, I still bought a few things myself. Uh, I bought the new Bob Mould album, Sunshine Rock. So far, best album 2019, hands down. Yep. Um, I went and bought that the day it came out. Yeah. And then I, I looked in their $5 like markdown bin of like new markdown stuff, and I picked up Darius Koski's first solo album. He He's in um, Swing and Utters. His first solo album is great. His second solo album is terrible, but whatever. And then I picked up oh the the pressure left is full length. Oh cool for five bucks. It's like oh nice yeah. So got a couple things there. Well, I guess we should get mm-hmm. into the show. <laughs> Man, so I'm gonna. I had a really hard time writing notes for this week's episode. Yeah, yeah. This one didn't inspire a lot of thoughts and it's not even because either like nothing neither of the releases on this episode are bad right but i guess we can we can do our usual and take a look at the punk charts absolutely so we're doing the year 1988 and as i was saying to you before we recorded this is a grim year for punk yeah it kind of makes me think if there's something wrong with the end of a decade for punk. It doesn't really apply to the 70s, but currently 2018, 2019 has not been great for punk. Yeah. And it's like been... 88, 89 is not great for punk either. Though 98, those... 99, there's some really, yeah. really good stuff in those two years. So and 2008 and 2009 is really good too. So there's, no, it's not really anything connected. That, that theory doesn't hold water, but. No. I, I can see why the 80s, though, like the late 80s, why it drifted so much. And because you're really only like a decade into punk, you know, a little over a decade into punk. So you have people, you have some people really running out of ideas, and then you have other people wanting to do really wildly different things. Mm-hmm. And so it just gets really scattered. And yeah. then, so I think a lot of the stuff that's like, maybe more traditional is just like rote by then yeah and then 
And you also, the more experimental stuff is just kind of hit or miss, or it gets really heavy into like another genre almost. I also think that uh, the late 80s were very dominated by metal. So, like, you have all your hair metal, and and then, but then you also have like the boom of like power metal and thrash metal. And well, yeah. And, and, and then you have crossover, you, at, you have suicidal that's tendencies. What I was say. The trends for 88 crossover thrash looks like it's one of the big ones so yeah there's the suicide tendencies album how will how will i laugh tomorrow when i can't even smile today okay whatever there's a dri album dirty rotten imbeciles four of a kind ludicrist they're a crossover thrash band yeah i mean you got stuff like um, infest some kind of thrashy yeah the rudimentary peen yeah. eyes in there with cacophony well, and um, you have stuff like other stuff that's getting like really heavy like yeah. like rollins band yeah lifetime you yeah. have like uh, uh there's rape man uh, two nuns and a pack mule steve albini edgelord yeah. the the king of the edgelords yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean you have the kind of the real birth of grindcore you've got napalm death you've got and then even like something that you would consider like maybe more straightforward punk rock and this kind of ties more into what our, we're actually talking about for our album and ep but like naked ray gun still has a really metallic I'm, edge to it true but i also wanted to say that that should be number one on this list yeah jettison is, is that, a great record it's definitely right it's definitely better than suffer by bad religion which is <laughs> higher on the list yeah definitely uh <laughs> yeah like the actual punky stuff yeah naked ray gun bad religion there's what there's fucking dead milkman beetle bubba yeah. screeching weasel <clears throat> yeah see and screeching weasel looks like it's that dumb album title booga 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 i'm not gonna say <laughs> i was gonna say i wasn't gonna say <laughs> i don't want to give them the satisfaction i don't know of their dumb album title but uh so there's that the screeching weasel and there's also a mr t experience album a <laughs> couple groovy ghoulie singles and i want to say there's probably a couple more like it looks like this is the re the beginning stages of the rebirth of pop punk yeah which were our ep we're talking about today. there's all roy says by all right right see and that shows you what kind of year it is because there's an all album and that's one of the good albums of the year <laughs> What are the other trends? There's what do we have? We have some goth. Yeah, a lot of goth. Uh, there's Nick Cave. There's Susie Sue. There's Fields of Nephilim. <laughs> you got some other post punk stuff too. You've got like the Feelies. Yeah. Wire. Um, a, a later Wipers record. And then you got your art punks. Like Pure Rubu's got some stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's a. It's not a. I don't like most of this. Yeah, no, yeah, it's really not, it is not a, a red letter year. No. The, even, I think the best. Even, like, the hardcore stuff, like. It's like New York hardcore is taking off big time. Yeah. During this, this era. Oh, God, Fearless Iranians from Hell. Crossover Thrash Band. <laughs> it's got a picture of the Ayatollah on the album cover. Uh, <laughs> God, that's dated. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it reminds me of that Simpsons joke where Marge holds up like the the t shirt. <laughs> the Ayatollah t shirt. <laughs> it's the it's the yard sale episode. <laughs> yeah. The only oh, to me, the best hardcore going on at this time is the Discord stuff. There's like Dag Nasty and Soul Side and Happy Go Licky. Yeah. But which we can also talk about a little bit later. There's government issue that year. I feel like if I was around in '88, that's what I'd be listening to. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, and some of the stuff like Nick Cave, you know, like some of the stuff that feels a couple steps away from punk that that's showing mm -hmm. up on this list would be would probably be something I would be listening to as yeah. well. But yeah, I would definitely be itching for some real good punk. Just just really good, solid punk. And there's really not any. Yeah. Not a lot of it. Uh, other than the um, Discord stuff. Yeah. Well, you ready to talk about our albums? Yeah. Well, going off of Discord. 
being yeah, perfect the launching. only light <laughs> in 88. Yeah. <laughs> so, for our album this week, we got number 152 on the album charts. And album is kind of stretching it, but whatever. It is Swizz with their self-titled album, Swizz. <laughs> Cool total power. It's what six songs long? It's it's pretty short. It's really not an album. <laughs> no. It it's really only called an album because it was pressed on a twelve inch. Yeah, because it's like twenty minutes long. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not even ten songs. It may be eight at the most. Yeah, it's eight tracks. And they're all single word song titles. Ghost, taste, wash, tune, stone, quick, draw, frame. Yeah, Swizz were very uh blunt. Yeah. Uh, Swizz were from Washington, D.C. This album was released on Samich Records. And do you know anything about Samich? So I actually stumbled across that last night. I was researching something else entirely. Um, and I came across this interview with Ian McKay where he talks about Swizz because they asked him, like, why didn't you put out the Swizz stuff or something to that extent. Um, <laughs> and he talks about how he. Like, they talked shit about Discord, and, like, Ian McKay specifically. And so he was like, well, fuck you then. I'm not going to put out your stuff. (laughs) And so he just was, he didn't do it. But then he says in that interview, he's like, but they were put out by Sandwich Records, which was his sister's label, right? Yeah, yeah. Amanda Amanda McKay. Amanda McKay's label, and he funded it and distributed it. So he he basically put (laughs) it out. And... And Discord worked with their bands later on, and Jason Farrell did some, you know, some ar- some album artwork oh, yeah. for Tons them. Of. So it was just like a funny little thing. It was just like it wasn't really a big beef, but it was enough that he was just like, "Fine, I'm not going to release your music." Wow. So it's interesting you found that article because I found an article. I think it was with Razor Cake. Uh, they wrote a really long article around one of the Red Hair albums was coming out that um, they talked about how DC didn't really seem to care about Swizz that much. And they they felt like they were ignored by the scene. And one one comment I read said that um, pe- people in DC can only care about one hardcore band at a time. <laughs> and most of those bands featured Ian McKay. Yeah. <laughs> so they had a little, I don't know, there's a little saltiness, I guess, going around from everybody then. Because they said... They had way better turnouts when they would go out of town and go to other cities and go on tour. So it's funny. I guess they were just... Well, okay. So well, I wanted to say about Sandwich real quick. Uh, Sandwich was founded by Amanda McKay and Eli Janney, who is possibly the brother of Eddie Janney. I don't know. If, I couldn't find if it's his brother or cousin or one of those who, who played in Rites of Spring. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. And Eli Janney played in Rain, one of my favorite like that discord era wasn't actually on discord bands and he also played in girls against boys but amanda mckay like ran the label the but i was gonna say what the issues with discord may also come from the fact that vocalist sean brown was the original vocalist for dag nasty who was kicked yeah. out so the saltiness is probably i think it mostly stems from sean um yeah Though, I mean, even Discord st- re- later released some DAG recordings with Sean. So mm-hmm. so they've obviously gotten yeah. over it, but you'd be stupid to 
still be angry. Well, yeah, I mean, and I don't see Ian McKay being the kind of person who like actually holds a grudge against (laughs) anyone. It it just doesn't seem to fit his personality. Yeah. So the personnel on this album is Sean Brown on vocals, Jason Farrell on guitar, Nathan Larson on bass, and Alex Daniels on drums. Like I said before, Sean was in Dag Nasty. Jason would later do Blue Tip and Redisonic, and Nathan wound up playing in Shudder to Think. So, also, Sean, Jason, and Alex later reunited as Sweet Belly Freakdown. (laughs) And then again as Red Hair later. Alex wouldn't be in Red Hair, but Sean and Jason would be. Yeah. So, Swizz kind of play that Revolution Summer style sound. But they themselves are quick to admit that they were not part of the Revolution Summer thing. Um, I read an article where he, Sean said he like had it explained to him later. <laughs> he was like, I was there. Yeah. It wasn't really a thing until later. Yeah. So, <laughs> And he also says that they were also real political and Swizz was never a very political band. Yeah. But he did admit that Embrace was a big influence. Like, Jason Farrell admitted that Embrace was a big influence on Swizz's guitar playing. Which you could totally hear, because it's got those... What do you call that, like, type of rhythm guitar that they're playing? It's almost like triplets? Mm-hmm. A lot. Yeah. A lot of those... Like, kind of little... <laughs> yeah. There's just those little triplet flourishes at the end of riffs. I love those. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do, too. And that's I actually like do that a lot playing. when I play. The guitar playing is my favorite part of the album. Like, Jason Farrell's guitar is so good. Oh, yeah. he um, And you could tell it, that style of playing was also a huge influence on Sarah Kirsch and, like, her million of other bands. Yeah, I was going to say, this This reminds me big time of Fuel. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I really like Swizz a lot. And they're a band that I... Like, the whole exclusion from the Discord and DC scene thing really did hurt them, like, in a in a big way. Because it made them a band that no one talked about for a long time. So they're a band that were complete, completely overlooked for me as a punk growing up. That when I finally heard them, which was probably when that Red Hair album came out, I was like, holy shit, this is incredible. Like, why don't people talk about this band? It's just these big meat hooky riffs and like, but it's also kind of like embrace-ish, like the whole feel of the band. And Yeah, I'm wondering, like, yeah, probably not being on Discord is what hurt them because they're from an era of hardcore that's kind of ignored because, they're, like we were saying, it's super grim. Like, there's not a lot of good stuff going on then. So... The only thing from that time period that people still talk about is typically the Discord stuff, and that's purely just so people can go, who, what was Discord putting out in the late 80s? And then people go check it out. Mm -hmm. They don't know to go look at Samich Records, you know, or 
uh, I can't remember the name of the label that Rain came out on, but it was run by um, Guy from Rites of Spring. So those little ones, they got ignored. And it's, it's yeah, them being on Discord, they probably would have been talked about much more. It was uh, Peterbilt? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that Rain record's really good. Because the, the Discord or, bands really just at EP, this time... Guess, but yeah. Yeah. The Discord bands at this time are what? Uh, Happy Go Licky, Soulside, uh, Dag, Dag, yeah, yeah, Dag was probably the biggest yeah. in the scene, and plus you had a minor threat connection there with Brian Baker, and oh, I'm blanking. Shudder to think was starting then, but I think they would really blow up in the '90s. Oh, and Ignition, that's the other one, which there's a very similar sound to Ignition. Mm. Ignition, I think Ignition was carrying on the Revolution Summer vibe, you know, after Embrace and Rites of Spring. And I guess Grey Matter was still around at this point, too. Now you got me curious, because I'm trying to think of what even... It seems like kind of a lean year, even for Discord. Yeah, there's not a lot of albums. 88. So, It Was Arson by Shudder to Think came out in 88. Well, actually, that was a Samich record. Yeah. Damn. Wow. Fire Party? Yeah, Samich? Yeah. See, and Soulside, that's even a Samich record. So, right. Fugazi by Fugazi came out in 88. At the end. That's the first EP, right? Uh, Yeah. Because even Ignition is listed technically as just being distroed. So, yeah, what did they put out in 87? Because in that Ian MacKay interview, he talks about how, like, kind of, like, one of one of the other contributing factors into the, the Swizz thing was, like, and just, like, any time there were bands that they didn't work with and people were like, why didn't you work with them? Why didn't you put out their records? He was just like, we wouldn't, like, we didn't have the money. Like, we... We would put the money yeah. into a release, and then it would take a while for the money to come back for us to be able yeah. to put it into the next thing. So they had, what, in 87, there's a Wig Out at Dinko's by Dag Nasty, and there's Embrace by Embrace. Right. So there's some big releases. And there's a Scream record then. Beef, I mean, I don't think Beef Eater was in Ignition. We're bringing in a lot of... Yeah. <laughs> Those are the ones maybe they shouldn't have spent the money on, but... That Egg Hunt 7-inch probably wasn't doing very well back then. Though, weirdly, it's still in print. Like, they keep it in print. I guess it's because of the you know, my kind of connection. So, people are like, yo, we have to have this yeah. available at all I mean, Discord time. tries to keep everything in print yeah. as much as they can. But, yeah, I don't I don't know. I um, There's the uh, Minor Threat Live album. So, that was them doing a money grab yeah. in 88. <laughs> but it's um, yeah, such, do- such a quiet time for punk really yeah because a lot of releases that i thought were like 88 releases 88 89 were actually like 90 to 93 yeah. like all those sarah kirsch bands don't start until like 1990 and like admiral who's like one of my other favorite unknown bands that only released two eps that play this exact same style of hardcore they did 90 and 91 so yeah it's it's an interesting time. Yeah, I mean, we don't get anything from... Yeah, we really don't get anything from the Bay Area until 90. Well, was Screeching Weasel a San Francisco band? Well, yeah. And Mr. T Experience, and I think the Groovy yeah, Ghoulies. So, guess, like, they're all... I guess, the, I guess we don't get anything good. <laughs> was Green Day doing anything in 88 yet? Or was that too... Were they too young to do anything like that back then? Well... I'm not super familiar with their discography, so I have to actually go look. I mean, they didn't put out 39 Smooth until 90. Until 90. Um, yeah. I mean, they were maybe were playing in garages then. They... Op Ivy. Op Ivy was around in 88. They put out an EP in 89. Um, when was Pinhead Gunpowder? Mm, 90? They may be more 90s, yeah. yeah. Um, looking at the EPs that came out in 88, which we're not at it yet, but... You can see there's something going on over, over there. So there's the Operation Ivy, Hectic right. EP. There's the Gorilla Biscuits, self-titled EP. Infest, self-titled EP. Moss Icon, Chain of Strength. So it's like yeah, a... there's a Crimp Shine EP. Judge. Judge. A little more of your Oakland. Project X. Um, yeah. So that's what it was. The emphasis was on heavier music by this point. But I mean, it's Wiz, I guess. They are a hardcore band, but they're... Their tones are much warmer, so they they don't really fit in with any of the hardcore bands from the era outside of the Discord scene. Like, they don't have the crunchy 
like New York hardcore sound or the youth crew. Yeah, they're a little more rubbery and mm-hmm. better guitar players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Swizz were, I guess it, we have to thank Jade Tree for keeping everyone aware of who Swizz are because they did that discography compilation in the 90s. And which that kind of makes sense. Jade Tree's, the type of hardcore that Jade Tree put out was of the smarter variety, I guess. For yeah. lack of a better term. I mean, and Blue Tip in 95. I, mm-hmm. mean, I mean, Blue Tip are. Yeah, yeah, that could have also done a lot of lot to uh, remind everyone. I mean, how good are those Blue Tip records? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love Blue Tip. Um, yeah, Redisonic, not as much, but... Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't even like Red Hair nearly as much as the U.S. Wiz. Yeah, yeah, Redisonic kind of leans maybe a little more... Red Hair leans a little more towards Redisonic than Swizz. Yeah. Yeah, which in the chronology makes sense because... Redisonic, it's and red hair are active around the same time. I'm not even sure if Redisonic's around anymore. Draw, take one. As far as my notes go, I don't really have anything else here <laughs> about Swizz. I read a bunch of interviews. I even found like some really shitty interview from like 1988 where the interviewer asked dumb questions like, What kind of underwear are you wearing? And what's your favorite food? So, the- I, to go back to our, <laughs> our, uh, our s- salt, uh, <laughs> our beef. <laughs> um... <laughs> That's a thing that you find a lot when you're researching these bands is you find a lot of real shitty interviews by some kid who doesn't <laughs> know what kind of questions to ask. So you have yeah. stupid questions like, how did you guys meet? And like, what's it like <laughs> being in a band? And it's like, they're not rock stars. There's not like crazy stories to tell. It's, they're just a punk band. Like, you know. You can ask them more about their creative process or their influences or, you know, I don't know. Like, I feel like there's more to talk about there, but very little of that comes up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the best interview I read was the Razor Cake interview, and it covered, like, huge swaths of their careers. So it was talking about Red Hair and Blue Tip and Sweet Belly Freak Down and, you know, all the bands. So it wasn't... And Dag Nasty. And so <laughs> I think in that interview, though, I did read the part where... Sean said he asked Ian why Minor Threat broke up, and he said it was because Brian Baker wanted to sound like U2. <laughs> <laughs> and that Dag Nasty was him trying to do that? I'm like, what? Dag Nasty doesn't sound like Weird. U2. Not even remotely close. <laughs> it's just funny what hardcore kids in the mid-80s were thinking about. Melody, fuck you! <laughs> yeah. Well... You want to wrap things up here and move on? Yeah, yeah. So what would you give this EP? Yeah. Um, it's so short. It is. And a lot of the songs sound the same. But I do enjoy it a lot. So, But I like the sound. Yeah. that it. My biggest complaint is the vocals. They... Sean's vocals are decent, 
but I want to say there's a weird, it's going to sound really weird, with the type of guitar tones and riffs that they're playing combined with his vocal style, I have a weird, almost butt rock sort of vibe going on. Like, yeah. biker vibe going on. I don't know why, why that is, because they're not that. Does it's, that make sense? It, like, there's It's a little Rollinsy. It's got like an ignorant streak <laughs> yeah. or something, you know? So, there, there is something about Swizz like... that feels like there's kind of this... I think there's some intentionality to that. Because I think that from what, from what I've read about them, it, it feels like they were trying to do something more hard, like hardcore, than... Mm-hmm like Brides of Spring and, you know, those bands. And so I think there's there's almost kind of like a tongue-in-cheek kind of uh, toughness. Yeah, I could see that. And it it kind of plays into, like, their imagery and some of their lyrics. The best way I can describe it is a biker bar band covering Brides of Spring. (laughs) Like the new rhythm and blues quartet (laughs) in RBQ. Uh, (laughs) And, em- and Embrace smashed into the same band. <laughs> uh, Swiss fans are going to hate that comparison. Uh, <laughs> you know, I didn't realize until I was looking at pictures of Swizz that Sean Brown was black. Oh. Have you seen pictures of Swizz? <laughs> I thought I had. Yeah, oh. he is. Yeah, that doesn't and the get only, talked about. It doesn't at, like, I mean, at all. There is a... S- it doesn't have to be, I guess. <laughs> no. But you'd think that Sean was the original vocalist to Dag Nasty, that it would be a bigger point. Maybe he didn't want to make it a point, though. I mean, I I could very I mean, much a, understand there's that. There's a song, he does address it in the, there's a song called Tylenol that he, like, does, uh, he addresses racists. But he's mainly talking about skinheads and Nazis. Yeah. So, I guess anyone, a lot of people at the time were talking about skinheads and Nazis, and they didn't have to be, you know, a person of color. I don't know. It's interesting. It's when I saw the pictures, like, oh, surprising. And I think there was an interview with Sean Brown on like Afropunk on one of their one of the uh, I think it's a blog maybe or a zine or something. But it, the article itself just mainly just talked about Dag Nasty. So it was just it's funny. I don't know. You think it would be a bigger point, but it's not, which is interesting. I guess I don't know. Maybe Bad Brains already like had everything people needed to talk about that in the DC hardcore scene, so it wasn't really that big of a yeah. deal. I mean, I, I could know. see one. Yeah. Yeah, I could see Sean just being like, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, he doesn't owe everyone his opinion on racial politics. Like, it's... <laughs> no. I mean... No. It's just weird that you don't see, like, think pieces today, which you think you would, because that's the type of society we're <laughs> in now. That's the way punks are now. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's I'm reading an interview where he with him. I'd like to read more of this. He talk he talks about like uh Nazis in in the early DC scene. Yeah. Yeah, this is that. Oh, this is the Afropunk interview. Um mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I would give this I would give it like a 4.25. Wow. You're going high. I really I just um, really like the sound. Yeah. And I... and, and they're not and I feel like they've, yeah, they're very underrated. So maybe I'm wanting to rate them higher just to be like, you should listen to them. You yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm going to go more like 3.75. Um, I love the guitar tones a lot. I just, the vocals didn't do a lot for me. I don't know. I I have a little, maybe a little bit of personal attachment. I, I, um, I did listen to Swizz a lot when I was working um in bank operations, scanning car loans. <laughs> uh, I listened to that <laughs> discography album on, on Spotify at least a few times. Just real good music to throw a bunch of boxes full of car loans onto pallets and alone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, that it's not on Spotify uh, anymore. Yeah. So, hey, Jade Tree, put that shit back on there. Yeah. It's the kind of, yeah, it's the kind of, like, tough, hardworking music <laughs> <laughs> that that I needed to get through that job. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm super un 
informed when it comes to Swizz as far as I just I've not I don't think before this episode I really listened to Swizz so I don't know I came in completely fresh to this album and it didn't do a whole lot for me I mean I liked it but I didn't love it so I don't know did you know that Sean Brown is a tattoo artist yeah I read that a lot I um, didn't know that I just came across his, his Instagram places. He owns a. Is this stuff any good? Because he owns a shop in Hyattsville, Maryland. Hmm. He, he owns Whistle Whistle Stop Studio. I don't know. Let me look at his art. It's pretty uh, traditional, neo traditional stuff. A really yeah. good. Uh, it's a really nice flower on the hand. He's got some really good stuff, actually. I didn't know that. Well, goddamn! <laughs> why don't you go get one? <laughs> now all my, uh, all the rest of my tattoo space is is. For Dave Quiggle, <laughs> you've got them. They're now all that I live out here, close enough. Yeah, you're close enough. That <laughs> well, anyway, moving on to our EP. Yeah. So our EP is number one fifty eight on the EP chart, and it is Cringer, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. Cringer are started in Hawaii and then moved to LA. This album was released on v- Vinyl Communications, who also weirdly released Go 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 Earhart, Slap of Reality, Heroin, and Mersbo. What? The label weirdly turned into a noise label at the <laughs> later end of its career. Very strange. And then they started releasing with a bunch of Cringer 7 inches in full length. And so it's just like. Ugh, weird, weird pivot there. Cringer's two primary band members are Lance Hahn and Gardner Maxim. And normally, so <laughs> here's the personnel for this album. Uh, Lance Hahn plays drums and does vocals. Gardner Maxim is on bass and vocals. And Simon Barry plays guitar. Now, normally... Lance doesn't play drums in Cringer. This is the only release he played drums on. They had drummers on the albums on either side, uh, Dave Carr and Derek Imus. But I guess for some reason, I guess uh, Derek or Dave had left the band, and they were like, "Shit, we don't have a drummer. Lance, you play them." <laughs> and so he doesn't play any guitar on the album. Oh, <laughs> which is what he does on every other single Cringer album. <laughs> yeah, that's what he did in. J Church. J Church. Yeah, it's like, it's what he's known for. And Gardner started in Cringer playing guitar and then moved to bass. And this Simon Barry guy plays guitar on this album. This guy who was only on this 7 inch. I don't think he was on anything else. And that may figure into why this 7 inch isn't that great. Yeah. Especially compared to the rest of Cringer's music. So they play a style of pop punk that wasn't really doing a lot in 88. So we were talking about Mr. T experience and Groovy Ghoulies and Screeching Weasel kind of being like trying to bring back for almost Ramon's core style pop punk. Um, I don't think the Lookout sound really started yet, though Cringer did release a 7-inch called Karen on, on Lookout later. So they're in that vein, but they're this is a rough EP. Um, it sounds 
like just the sound quality of it is really not very good yeah i believe it was someone who'd never recorded anyone before and he recorded them for free i think it's the article i read and the drumming i did notice while listening to i was like man this drumming's not good (laughs) and it's like yeah it's because the guy playing's not really a drummer he can play okay (laughs) yeah yeah so the the best tracks on the album are definitely the ones that Lance sings. I, I want to say they're probably 50-50 split between him and Gardner. The title track is probably the best song on the album. It's the last track last track on the EP. Um yeah, I, I don't know. I love I love J Church. So I like J Church more than I was than kinda really, <laughs> Yes, yeah, that's true. I listened to the full length that they put out and it's much better. But it's it's not quite as tight as what Jay Church would turn out to yeah. be later. Um, I, I listened to a little bit of some of their other stuff on the the compilation that's on Spotify, um, just to kind of it was just to kind of have some more familiarity with Cringer and what they sounded like. And yeah, it was kind of like every other song was pretty mm-hmm. good. I, I I don't know. I didn't love it. I mean, I I sound wise, they're interesting. They're doing a lot of different things. Like, they yeah. have some slow songs, and they have some... Yeah, they just kind of tried everything. <laughs> that may come from being... They started in Hawaii, and they were one of the few bands, few punk bands in Hawaii. And I'm wondering if they're like, well, since we're one of the only ones, we kind of have to do everything just to cover the bases. Gardner was in a band called Sharks, with an X, and uh, which is uh, has the distinction of being the first hardcore band in Hawaii. And I... I bet that list is real small too. Like, <laughs> there may. I wonder how many hardcore bands there've ever been from Hawaii. Fifty? I mean, you have to think there are a ton of bands that never went anywhere. But specifically, hardcore bands. Probably. Yeah. Uh, Fifty is probably too many. I yeah, mean, maybe it's not I mean, a very big know. state. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be generous, just in case there's plenty of uh, garage bands that never started. But you never know. Lance wrote all the lyrics on this album, too, which is interesting. It's funny. Like, listening to Cringer, going into this, I was like, I like Cringer. My only real experience with Cringer before was the Karen 7-inch, which might be the best thing they ever released. So I, I had, like, a, a inflated sense of, like, oh, this is what Cringer sounds like. Yeah. It's like, Cer- not quite as good. And you certainly want to extend them some goodwill for, you know, for, for J Church. Um, oh, absolutely. Because J Church was a great band and released an insane amount of music, sixteen yeah. albums. Like that's yeah. Albums. Lance, <laughs> he's he was a prolific artist musician. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think he definitely gets deserves all the cred for what makes Cringer worth listening to. Yeah, yeah, the songs he is singing are definitely the highlights. I am curious how much of the influence he had on the guitar work because it does sound like his type of playing. So yeah, he probably just taught someone how to play it, and they didn't play it as well because <laughs> no one else could yeah. play the drums, and they probably recorded yeah. it all live anyway. Yeah, it's a sloppy seven inch, and yeah. So I did read Lance was a contributor for Maximum Rock and Roll for a really long time, and I, you know, I have my issues with 
yeah. with them. But um, I did read, I did found an old interview with Cringer from an issue of Maximum Rock and Roll, and it was um, right after they played a show at Gilman Street with Neurosis and No Effects. <laughs> <laughs> this is like nine. It was like 1990. So it's crust neurosis. Yeah. Yeah. And they said it was one of the worst shows they had ever had, ever, because it was full of like meathead tough guys, and like they hated it. They hated it so much. Um, you know what? I'm gonna try and pull it up. There are some really solid quotes in that interview. So this is a scan from Maximum Rock and Roll number 84, May 1990. Are you sure you don't want to talk about the show? I mean, do you feel that you accomplished anything by playing it? Lance, well, let's put it this way. We've never played a show like that before, and for those of you that don't know, we ended up playing with Neurosis and No Effects, who are really cool people and bands, but for whatever reason... Oh, really cool people and bands. But for whatever reason, the crowd were... Gardner interjects, boneheads! <laughs> Lance says, in a word, and basically. Not all the crowd. Not all of the crowd, but but enough to spoil it and sing as we're wimpy. Well, not wimpy, but a melodic, catchy, Gardner says, we're wimpy, <laughs> Lance says, punk band, as opposed to raging, chunky, metallic hardcore. They didn't really appreciate us very much or our profound post-structuralist, nihilist, quasi-feminist, anarcho-commentary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gardner says, it was kind of dumb because I felt like we were being a teacher or something, like lecturing our class, and it was like, don't do that. No, it was stupid. So there you are up on stage being objective. Yeah. Um, people who wanted to see us were getting hit and stuff. It wasn't fun. It wasn't fun at all. And it was just a strange situation because they would totally get into every song we played, no matter what speed, no matter what it was like, and just throw each other around. So it was obvious they weren't listening. And then between songs, despite all the energy spent, they felt rather than say, well, you know, at least we could move it, move to it. They decided to yell at us. Weird. Like, fuck you, and say things like, play faster, which just made us play slower. And aside from that, I think pits are a very passe thing. Just idiotic. And embarrassing. <laughs> this is actually a really great uh, interview. Um, <sighs> yeah. <sighs> Ugh. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at one point in it, it says, you probably could have yelled at them and called them fags and they would have listened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to get on their lang- yeah. on their level. <laughs> yeah, and it just made me go, man, Lance sounds like he was a cool guy. <laughs> he, I know he wrote a lot of, like, feminist theme songs, yeah. and which I'm sure he doesn't probably get enough credit for, for writing way back then that way. Yeah, I mean, you have a couple of Fugazi songs. Mm-hmm, yeah. Well, what would you rate this EP? <sighs> uh, 2.25. I really yeah, didn't enjoy listening and that's to it. Primarily, that's primarily because of like the one and a half good songs on it. It would have been below two if those songs weren't on there. And Lance wasn't the singer on some of them. Yeah, just listen to J Church. Just, just skip Cringer. Just go to J Church. You got plenty to choose from. Well, all right. I guess that'll wrap up today's the, episode. Yeah, the dark days of... Mm-hmm. The yeah, we said it was grim. Well, what are we doing next week? Um, <laughs> well, it's just five years away. Is it five years or only four? Let's see. We're doing 1991. It's like three years. 88. We're doing 88 yes. now. See, you can tell I was homeschooled. 89, um, 90, 91. <laughs> if you count 88, it's four uh, you years. Don't count, though. <laughs> anyway, we're covering 1991. And we got number 173 on the album charts. And <laughs> it's One Bad Ugh. Pig, Ice Cream Sunday. <laughs> not a not a very a, big improvement. A Christian punk rock band. Cannot wait to tear this up. Because I've heard yeah, this album before. Yikes. Um, and our EP is number 91 on the charts, and it is Lifetime with their self-titled EP, Lifetime. Something good. And yes, that is, Lifetime. It is. It's also an EP from 91, so it may be terrible. So I think it'll be um, I think it'll be better than One Bad Pig. Oh, most definitely. <laughs> I think it'll be better than that Cringer EP we just did. So 
Yeah, one bag pig will actually be worse than yeah. the cringer EP. Well, so don't spoil it. <laughs> look forward to it. <laughs> Go listen to it. I scream Sunday. <laughs> cool. Did we win? I really like that Swizz album. I'd say we we didn't win by much, but I don't think Cringer I say totally we... took, took away all of our earnings in our <laughs> no. mixed gambling metaphor <laughs> in this game. Because lotteries are just, you win or you don't. <laughs> I, I guess uh, you can get a small a did... smaller payout, like more people. How many numbers yeah. did we get? <laughs> Damn, how do lotteries work? <laughs> Did we get three of the six? <laughs> and no, no Powerball. Power ball. <laughs> you didn't win the Powerball. Uh, well, it's fine. continue to follow Just move us past on it. Instagram. <laughs> move past it. Let's move past it. Um, continue to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Punk Lotto Pod. We have an email. It's punklottopod at gmail.com. And we have a website, punklottopod.simplecast.fm. Give us some ratings and some reviews. All of our episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play. I assume they're on Google Play. I've never been able to check to make sure. I don't know how people find podcasts on Google Play. And we're also on a bunch of random other players. So just if you if you use something like Overcast, we're probably on there. Stuff that just steals from iTunes yeah. RSS feeds. Um, we keep getting an email saying, you charted on the Colombian podcast charts or something like so that. So weird. It's like 383 on the Colombian. It's like, oh, we're not even the, <laughs> we're not even in the top 100 <laughs> Colombian podcast. We don't speak Spanish, so I don't know why we would be on there anyway. I'm assuming it's spam. We, um, we got some excellent feedback this week from uh, one of the members of Wild Honey and they said some really nice things about the podcast and it was um, oh they also sent a correction uh, they have not recorded their second LP unfortunately those two songs that were released well Na- the one Naive Castle because the seven the, the not other song out isn't out yet they haven't they haven't released that because it's it would be on the seven inch yeah it's a Slumberland record seven inch um, single which this isn't news. This has been yeah. reported already. It's a cover of uh, Kiss Me by Sixpence None the Richer. So, uh, it's so good. We uh, we thank you for listening and saying nice things about our podcast, which we also said nice things about your <laughs> band. So, <laughs> it's mutual. Um, but yeah, if 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 we get nothing else out of this podcast, at least we got <laughs> that. So, <laughs> all right. Um, I guess we're just gonna have just gonna to move, have past, to move it. past it. Just, just move past. It. Just, just move past. It. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Move past it. I can't get. Let's it. move right. past it. Let's put it behind us, guys.